yes, good morning. Um, thank you very much, uh, Matt. No problem at all. It has been a, you know, I, I would like to second uh, Raj's comment. I mean, thank you so much for um, uh, organizing the BIPC conferences as well as all the NGRs um, in the last uh, few years. As, and we certainly look forward to um, contribute um, into, into NGRs um, in the upcoming years. Um, so this is going to be the last biopsy conference of this academic year. Um, and uh, so uh, for those fellows who are graduating this year, we certainly um, miss you guys and um, uh, would love to uh, keep in touch. And for those who are staying, we look forward to working together. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I uh, start this biopsy conference because I know that uh, there had been a delay and I don't wanna keep people, people um, more than uh, they, they need to. So um, we're planning to present three cases today. And uh, our first case is about a 68 year old woman with microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. And Dr. David Marioma is going to present uh, this case, the clinical part. David. Hey. All right. So this was a uh, lovely clinic patient I had recently, a 68 year old woman who was referred for microscopic hematuria and proteinuria. Uh, she didn't have a very extensive past medical history, just hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hypothyroidism. Uh, so she was taking some Synthroid, uh, Losartan for her blood pressure, and Libitor. Um, three months prior to uh, her referral, she had had some left flank pain, which was worked up by her primary care, and her urine had shown some protein microscopic hematuria. So the primary care ordered a 24-hour urine, which showed... Um, about 1,152 milligrams of protein. Uh, so the primary care doc ordered a CT, abdomen pelvis, which did not show uh, any stones or other abnormalities. Um, I think that was for the microscopic hematuria. Um, and then uh, she also saw an ophthalmologist. Uh, I, I don't really know exactly why she saw them, but um, this ophthalmologist said that her cornea had changes suspicious for amyloidosis. Um, so that was the information I had when she came in. Um, in terms of symptoms, she did report months of fatigue, a general reduction in appetite, some kind of bloating of the abdomen, and she felt her urine was more frothy. Um, so some constitutional symptoms and, and such, but no other symptoms uh, kind of going through everything else. Um, in her family, father had a history of a stone, a uh, sister using a hearing aid, but when uh, she was uh, over 65 years old, no other family history of any uh, renal disorders. And she never smoked. Um, she did unfortunately have a bout of heavy alcohol use a year prior um, due to her son passing away, but now she's kept it to three drinks a week um, and no recreational drug use. Uh, so in terms of objective data, so her blood pressure in the clinic was a little bit high, 145 over 82, but her vitals were otherwise normal. A physical exam was completely unremarkable, nothing, no edema, no rashes, um, no signs of volume excess. Um, her labs, uh, her basic labs were pretty unremarkable. Electrolytes were all within normal limits. Uh, BU and creatinine were normal at 11 and 0 0.7. Um, it checked an A1C, which was 5.6, um, no anemia, no thrombocytopenia. Um, UA was significant for white blood cells, red blood cells, um, urine protein creatinine spot ratio 1.5 and albumin creatinine um, 1080. Uh, on microscopy that I performed in the clinic, I did see dysmorphic RBCs. Um, there were also uh, a bunch of white cells uh, but no cellular casts. Uh, so serological workup, um, basically no uh, hepatitis B or C, no HIV, uh, cryo is negative, complements were within normal limits, 
uh, RF was negative, ANA, ANCA titers, PLA2R were all uh, negative. Um, on monoclonal testing, her free light chains were normal um, with a kappa lambda ratio of 1.15. Um, in her SPEP, she had a faint oligoclonal banding, um, but they mentioned that there was a prominent faint IgG kappa band um, in the UPEP uh, kind of in line with that, an IgG kappa band present at the limit of detection in the setting of polyclonal gamma globulins. And uh, essentially for hematuria proteinuria without a clear explanation, um, order to renal biopsy. Okay, thank you. So questions for Dr. Marioma or differentials, if you could type them in the chat box or just say them, I, either way would be fine. Do you, have, um, do you know how long she's had hematuria and proteinuria for? Is this long standing? Uh, so she had never been tested for, uh, she had never really had any urine tests. Uh, I guess they just weren't felt to be indicated because she didn't, um, really have any issues. I don't know if they have checked they have protein a long time ago, but the only urine studies I had access to were when the primary care was working up this flank pain a few months prior. There is a question in the chat box. Was there any raccoon eyes? Uh, no, no, not on my exam. I didn't do a, you know, a real uh, ophthalmoscope exam, but no, nothing um, remarkable on, on physical exam of just her, her face and, and uh, periorbital region. Okay. Uh, in the differential so far, we have 1% dense deposit disease. Any other thoughts, questions? Or shall we move to the to the biopsy and see if we were able to say what that was, the cause. Okay, AL amyloidosis with that faint band. Yeah, both of them are good thoughts. Okay, so let's start. Let's start and see, and also fibrillary glomerulonephritis and IgA nephropathy, of course, with different manifestations and hematuria and fibrillary also um, with hematuria and proteinuria. All of those, I think that up to now are in the differential. Now let's see um, if any of those are present in this biopsy. So as you can see, I mean, a wonderful sample um, that uh, we could wish for, or maybe a little bit more than we could wish for, because there were more, about 100 glomeruli uh, per section. Um, of those, uh, about 100 or more, three to five were globulous girls and really minimal tubular interstitial fibrosis. As you can see in this low magnification view, not much black stuff in the cortex. So I would say that uh, this patient in terms of nephron endowment is likely on the more lucky side. As you know, there is a wide range. And uh, just uh, this is one of those um, assembled pictures that I show you in the last previous slide. And here you see 30 glomeruli just in this single picture. Um, so the density of glomeruli is high, so the patient has good capacity. And uh, when we uh, look at the glomeruli, I think that this picture is, is very representative of, of the entire biopsy because you see that there is heterogeneity in terms of lesion. Some of the glomeruli, such as this one and this one, and maybe this one, they look fairly unremarkable and bland. Nothing much is going on. And some of them are distinctly abnormal. Okay, so this is a closer look of one of those normal looking glomeruli. You see the capillaries, mesangium is not expanded. Everything looks fine. And while this is um, an example of one of those abnormal ones, in great majority of them, uh, we had uh, endocapillary hypercellularity segmentally involving the glomeruli. So you see that the structure of the capillary walls is, is disrupted um, and we have influx of leukocytes in, uh, in, in those areas. What are those leukocytes? Taking a closer look, I don't know if um, uh, your monitor allows for recognition that these uh, cells, they are neutrophils, they have 
um, uh, uh, the characteristic um, uh, feature of the nuclei of neutrophils. And in some areas, uh, glomerular basin membranes, they became faint. There was uh, an aggregation of cells and one could question that, okay, is there a segmental necrosis going on or not? And other examples, this is another one. Again, very segmental involvement of the capillary top by endocapillary hypercellularity. Again, questionable segmental necrosis. And this one happened to have uh, duplication of the Bowman's capsule with fibrous tissue filling this space, which one could call this is a fibrous crescent, but we did not see any cellular crescent or any obvious fibrous cellular crescent. Another glomerulus, segmental endocapillary hypercellularity with neutrophil influx. A better example of that, many neutrophils are in there. Okay, so we have a, a proliferative glomerulonephritis um, that is associated with influx of neutrophils into the capillaries. And just a few glomeruli, not many of them, they had these features of endocapillary hypercellularity in globally involving the glomerulus and therefore creating uh, accentuation of the lobular pattern of the glomeruli and creating a membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis pattern or MPGN pattern of involvement. Just the neighbor guy looks fine, does not have anything. The vessels look fine. Um, as you can see, um, no like thrombotic microangiopathy or anything else. And when looking at the tubular interstitium, as normal as it could get, tubules are back to back, brush borders are there, really no acute, uh, acute tubular injury. Um, so also now I see another differential monoclonal C3 glomerulonephritis. I guess that because of those neutrophils, um, that's, that's a good differential. Um, now, maybe the moment of truth, I don't know. Let's look at the immunofluorescence microscopy. So by immunofluorescence microscopy, for IgG, we had positive staining, not very bright, um, traced to one plus. I mean, this here, it looks a little bit more than actually it was over there. Um, uh, because I, I changed the setting so that you can see the deposits a little bit better. Trace to one plus IgG. It virtually mirrors what we saw by light microscopy. So seg more segmental involvement. Where are the deposits? So these are the capillary loops. We see granular staining, mainly in the peripheral capillary wall, but also some in the mesangial regions. The deposits were focal, meaning that not, not present in all the glomeruli, and they were segmental, meaning that they were not present in all the capillary loops, exactly mirroring what we saw in terms of glomerulonephritis in, <clears throat> in by light microscopy. Okay, what about the other um, uh, panel? So IgG, I showed you, C3, kind of similar to IgG, maybe a little bit stronger, same pattern exactly. Fibrin one was positive, I think, in one glomerulus. Here you see bright staining, meaning that indeed there was segmental necrosis. And uh, IgA, IgM, C1Q, and albumin, they were all negative. And when look, looking at kappa and lambda, kappa was positive, kind of similar to IgG and C3 and lambda was negative, was completely negative. So of course, when there is a significant bias of kappa versus lambda, well, we think that, okay, there, this uh, go, is going to be a monotypical, at least deposition process, or a monoclonal uh, immunoglobulin deposition process. So we have IgG, so the next step naturally would be to do IgG subtyping to confirm um, the monoclonality or monotypicality of the deposits. And we did that, but unfortunately, the IgG subtyping was negative in all of them. So it wasn't conclusive. Maybe that was because to begin with, the deposits, they were kind of dim. So there were not many deposits. And also, you know, the, when we do the subtyping, the sensitivity is less compared to when, you know, we'll, we use... Um, uh, basically polyclonal immunoglobulins for detection of 
IgG. So in order to further confirm our initial observation of the frozen sections, we also perform pronase digestion immunofluorescence microscopy. And as you know, that's a technique that is useful for observation of masked deposits. So this is what pronase digestion immunofluorescence microscopy show. Same pattern that we saw in frozen sections for IgG and for kappa, and exactly the same result and that we got by frozen sections we saw by lambda. So um, this is kind of confirmation that these deposits, they look like um, they are at least monotypical. If we can say exactly monoclonal or not. Okay, so what did electron microscopy show? So by electron microscopy, this is one of the glomeruli that showed more kind of like proliferative changes. So you see uh, in the capillary epicellularity, maybe influx of some leukocytes, and the podocytes, they show effacement. When looking more closer, here you see the capillary, one of those that is more patent. This is another one, podocytes in the outside and the thiliocytes in the inside. Uh, there is something here, maybe difficult for you to observe. So when we magnify that, we see that there is subepithelial deposits, kind of a small one. And there is another one here, a little bit bigger than the, the one that we saw, it's approaching to becoming kind of like complex. And there is another one here. Uh, and we don't see glomerular basal membrane reaction around it. So um, it's becoming more kind of hump like, maybe not the most photogenic humps, but we see multiple of these. Uh, two of them I've shown by arrows. There's a third one that I can see here. So we certainly have subepithelial deposits. In the mesangial regions, and in, in, uh, we had. Uh, ill-defined electron densities. So putting everything together, what are we dealing with? So the final diagnosis, okay, findings most consistent with proliferative glomerulonephritis. Of course, we had proliferative glomerulonephritis. And it seemed like the deposits are monoclonal, maybe. So that's why I use the, the word most consistent, because virtually what uh, we confirmed was the monotypicality of the immunoglobulins. But most consistent with proliferative glomerulonephritis with monoclonal immunoglobulin, IgG kappa deposition or PGNMID, predominantly active with mild chronicity. So what are the highlights uh, that uh, took us to that conclusion? So there was focal and segmental and the capillary epicellularity, rare glomeruli showing MPGN pattern of injury, and rare segmental necrosis, IgG kappa deposition by immunofluorescence microscopy, uh, we had subepithelial and rare mesangial deposits. Okay. Um, also, the patient clinically had, you know, that clinical, clinical history of serum monoclonal band, although that was like kind of faint. On the other hand, the interesting uh, point in this case was that we had neutrophils, which we can see in PGNM ID as well. We had C3 deposition, which also we can see in PGNM ID as well. And we had subepithelial complex deposits. But at the same time, when we put all of these together, of course, that pushes us to thinking that could there be an infection, an underlying infection or a concomitant infection? So we also suggested that the infection needs to be ruled out. So um, we will hear from Dr. Mariyama if uh, there is any follow-up about this case. But um, uh, I would like to share you a couple quick slides here as well. So the, this is the, uh, uh, the uh, case series from Colombia in 2004, going over PG uh, and MID. Um, overall, the PAR protein detection rate in these cases, as you know, it's um, uh, not very high, 30 to 40%. And clone detection is also 30 to 40%. Different patterns we can see, uh, the most common pattern is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and PGN pattern, but also you can see membranous pattern of glomerulonephritis. We can see mesangial proliferative. We can see crescents as well. Most of the deposits are IgG3 kappa and then IgG3 lambda and then other um, IgG, IgG subtypes. But what about the infection? Could there be any, any relationship between? So there are, interestingly, there are rare reports of PGNMID. Of course, PGNMID, it seems to me that it's a, it's, it's a kind of heterogeneous um, uh, condition. 
So there are rare reports in association with infections. So for example, in, in this paper, um, they, what they found, it was very interesting. I mean, kind of similar to, uh, to our case in terms of the, um, in terms of the histology, um, the, they did not detect an infection by cultures in this case. However, um, the, the uh, PGNM ID and the clinical course was kind of um, uh, the, the, uh, spontaneously resolving. So they brought up uh, the, the possibility that, okay, that clinical history more matched um, an infection. And, and in addition, the, the histology was uh, looking like an infection related to laminophritis. Interestingly, in that case, they also found that the patient had complement factor H mutation. So in other words, if you have a background that makes you prone as uh, you know, the, the differential that I've all made for C3 glomenophritis and an infection, um, then maybe you can get uh, a picture that is similar to PGNMID or maybe still can be classified as such. This is a, a, a more recent case report uh, from last year in a patient with Parvo B19. The, in this patient, the serology was positive for par Parvo B19. And also uh, this case, spontaneously resolved as well. So could this be really related to infection or not? So of course, I mean, we need to rule out lymphoproliferative disorders and you know uh, uh, th those conditions that need to be ruled out. But uh, also I pointed out that what we established was the monotypicality. And uh, this may um, uh, actually um, uh, be a, 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 a something related to that. So this is um, um, a paper in which uh, the, the Sammy Nasser and, uh, and others, they used heavy chain light chain uh, immunoglobulins for confirmation of the, um, uh, that indeed the deposits were monoclonal or still monotypical or not. And among the cases that they studied, there were 10 cases of IgG, PG, and MID, and two of them, after using uh, immunoglobulins that can detect heavy chain light chain, uh, they confirmed that indeed uh, they were polytypical. They were not monotypical. Is this the case here or not? We don't know. So uh, I'm curious to uh, learn from Dr. Marioma if there is any update or follow up about this case, and then questions. Uh, yes. So uh, I'm actually seeing her today at two o'clock. Um, so uh, we'll have some more follow up then. But um, after the uh, biopsy came back, I uh, I did call her and kind of do a very um, thorough kind of uh, repeat review of systems to see if there was some um, specific infectious symptom that I may have been missing. Um, there really wasn't other than this, these constitutional symptoms of fatigue. Um, I did uh, order an echo just in case I didn't even hear a, a murmur or anything, but just knowing how often endocarditis can, can yeah. cause these kind of presentations. Um, no vegetations on TTE, and um, I didn't feel the suspicion was high enough to do a TEE. Um, when she comes back today, <clears throat> I think I am going to order a few more infectious studies, um, specifically uh, I might just check a, a blood culture, um, Parvo B19, uh, which I wasn't thinking of, but uh, oh, why not? Um, she did see hematology in the interim. Uh, they are planning on a PET CT. Um, so, you know, if there's any kind of occult infection or, or something, they might pick something up there. Uh, and they're also going to plan on a bone marrow biopsy. It seems like so far, they're suspecting that this is either a B cell or a plasma cell mediated um, lymphoproliferative disorder. So they're going to work uh, diligently on ruling that out. Um, I'm going to kind of do those extra infectious tests, but um, you know, assuming they find something, we're probably planning on treating as, a, as an MGRS uh, kind of picture. Um, I also asked like if she had been anywhere in the world or, you know, maybe got exposed to something more unusual, like a parasitic infection or, but she's just really been here this whole time. No unusual exposures or anything like that. Thank you.
So Yoshio is asking, can the monoclonal IgG act as an inhibitor of complement factor H? And of course, um, yeah, that's uh, we, we see in C3 glomerulonephritis, and a component of that, uh, one could assume that uh, can occur in association with uh, monoclonal immunoglobulins that they deposit inside the glomeruli as well. Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the, for the interest of time, I will pass this, the presentation to Ram. All right, thank you, Bizad. And uh, I again, want to congratulate all the, the graduating fellows and to thank Matt again for organizing uh, um, RGR for the last six years. So um, I'm gonna present uh, two cases uh, in rapid fire succession here. Both of them have some a little unusual presentation and some unusual findings. So uh, kind of a, a good example of uh, you know, some unusual presentations here. So the first was a, a case that uh, we received from Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Pitchler. And so uh, Alex, I think uh, you're gonna present the clinical history. And I wanna again credit uh, David, our fellow who couldn't be here. Um, He's off this week. Who made the slides? Thank you. I did want to thank uh, Ram and David. I wish you were here, but um, uh, you, you, you've both put in a lot of work and done a lot of lectures and clearly put in a lot of work into teaching us pathology. So thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so this case, um, I can go into the, the details here. This is a 67-year-old really not much past medical history, had a uh, traumatic brain injury as a child when she fell from a tree and um, so has a history of cognitive impairment. Um, her only recent history was that she was admitted with a GI bleed about two months prior to the, the biopsy. And she had these oozing camera lesions which are from a hiatal hernia. So nothing, um, nothing really related to kidney disease. Um, following that admission, she had kind of persistent fatigue, her, her um, Blood counts never totally recovered, um, but but was she was generally feeling back to her usual self. And then you know, leading up to the the current presentation, um, it was really uh, the, the the fatigue started worsening, and then she started getting respiratory symptoms in you know just a week or two leading up to um, to to the presentation, where she started to get really dyspneic on exertion with cough. And then, uh, and then some more symptoms that developed were that she actually noticed a drop in her urine output and increasing lower extremity edema, which she had never had uh, previously. Um, and so she was sent, seen in clinic, uh, they got labs and they sent her straight to the hospital from, uh, from clinic. And so when she first arrived to the hospital, um, her hemoglobin was back down to 5.3. She came in hypotensive as well. Um, there was some suspicion that she may have had recurrence of, of you know, GI bleeding, uh, that the lesions had been treated, but, you know, maybe there was, they, they had re-bled. Um, she had a, a creatinine bump from 0.7. Uh, this, so this is within the span of a month that she went from 0.7 to 4. And, um, and creatinine just continued to trend up uh, during that, uh, during the hospitalization. So they did also some, with all of her respiratory symptoms, they did a chest CT on admission, which showed um, the, the read was diffuse clustered bilateral central lobular ground glass opacity. So it was most consistent with an atypical pneumonia. And then, um, you know, they, they also looked at, uh, looked at the urine, uh, three to 10 RBCs, trace protein. And then uh, there was a comment of gra granular cast from the nephrology consult. This was at the outside hospital. Um, her creatinine continued to trend up. Uh, they, they ended up sending off a full uh, glomerulonephritis workup uh, with there being suspicion for something else going on because they, you know, they treated her hypotension, they treated her anemia with, with a transfusion, but her uh, creatinine was still going up. So they did uh, an extensive workup and uh, out of the, the GN panel, you know, positive ANA, positive P ANCA, MPO titer of 39. And then, uh, so they, they ended up starting her on pulse steroids. At this point, her creatinine is approaching 10. So they, they did place a hemodialysis catheter and she was transferred um, uh, to Montlake for further management. 
Um, so when we, so when she first arrived here, we did um, a, another UA, which did not show any hematuria, proteinuria. We took a, a sample of her urine to the lab, you know, spun it down, and it was highly unremarkable. There were there were maybe a couple of scattered WBCs. We didn't, we couldn't find any. I mean, maybe one or two RBCs that were non-dysmorphic, and um, so just not not an impressive uh, urine sediment in general. Um, yeah, and then and then so we continued the steroids, um, uh, and then uh, we repeated a lot of the workup and added on a, a GBM uh, to the to the serologies that hadn't been sent. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, she was started on dialysis here as well, and um, her shortness of breath really seemed to respond well to volume removal, so she was feeling better. And then um, uh, we we resent some of the the glomerulonephritis labs and MPO titer. At this point, it's greater than eighty, and then the GBM was negative. And so diagnostic procedure and I'll hand it to Ron. Great, thank you, Alex. So any questions or comments about this kind of uh, unusual presentation? There were no other meds from uh, Dr. Corrales question. No other meds that she was taking, no okay. NSAIDs or anything, yeah. Okay, so we've got a very strong case for um, an ANCA type uh, uh, disease process of vasculitis given the very high repeat MPO titer, anti-GBM being negative, this color kind of a pulmonary renal syndrome that's going on, uh, definitely some evidence for some chest involvement from the CT, um, but why is the urine sediment so bland uh, if we've got a, you know, a rip roaring GN uh, in the kidney? Um, even the first UA had maybe a few RBCs. The second UA done here in our own hands was very bland. So, um, uh, so this is kind of the, the the question here. So there's a comment by um, uh, Abal uh, that maybe it's more involving uh, an arteritis rather than a glomerulonephritis. So, uh, so that's a good uh, good thought. Let's see let's see what the biopsy showed. So by light microscopy, in contrast to uh, uh, Bazad's case, we did not get 100 glomeruli. Uh, in fact, we only got about two glomeruli. Uh, you can see one over here and maybe a small one over here. Um, so we had a portion of cortex that you can see over here kind of transitioning into medulla. And we have some larger arteries that are sampled roughly at the cortical medullary junction. So probably in the arcuate size range um, that we're dealing with here. So let's take a little closer look at one of these. So here's one of those uh, glomeruli. There were only about two in the sample. Uh, pretty unremarkable, um, very bland looking. However, what is the structure over here? It's one of those arteries that I was referring to and it's very uh, unusual and atypical. So first of all, let's look at, we can see some of the outer adventitial layers uh, over here we can see that there's marked narrowing of the lumen, which is left over here. So this tiny little opening is what's left of the, uh, the artery and its lumen. But instead we have this accumulation of this very eosinophilic pink material in the, in the wall of the media of the, uh, the vessel. And uh, this has the consistency and color and texture of uh, fiber. So this looks like a necrotizing vasculitis. Now, so maybe that connects with the, uh, the uh, high, super high MPO titer, the anchor titers uh, that we were getting. But there are a little bit, uh, some unusual um, features of this. When we see um, ANCA um, vasculitis involving vessels, it, it tends to come from the lumen uh, outward. Uh, and so the luminal aspect will also be involved by uh, the necrotizing process. So here uh, uh, we have a kind of an interesting process where the lumen seems relatively spared, whereas the media is affected. Now, some of this could be, you know, the patchy distribution of the, the necrotizing process along the length of the vessel. So maybe there was endovascular involvement at some point and it kind of dissected through the media and maybe that's what we're seeing over here. But if we look at, some, at a closer power, uh, higher power at the same vessel, again, you can see this tiny lumen here with a few endothelial cells. So you can imagine the restriction of flow that's going to occur with this dramatic narrowing of uh, the, uh, the vessel lumen. So remember the pressure goes by the fourth power of the luminal diameter. So this is a really dramatic uh, reduction in flow 
through this vessel. But we, if we look closely, we can kind of see little whorls or circles um, that are present within this media. And so this is again suggesting that there was actually prior injury to this vessel, followed by recanalization. So this is where you know, the, the body is attempting to reopen uh, a blocked vessel. So there are new vessels that are forming, and it is these vessels that are actually seemingly in, uh, involved by, uh, by necrosis. And this might have been dissected through the entire media of the vessel causing compression uh, of, of the lumen. So this is a different view of that same vessel in a different level. This is a PAS uh, stain. Again, showing you know, the mark reduction in the lumen. Again, for your reference is right down here, this tiny little circle. There's a bunch of inflammatory cells that have also made their way into this expanded and highly remodeled uh, uh, media that is undergoing uh, uh, necrotizing changes as well. Now, I mentioned that there were only two glomeruli. Um, the one that I showed you before was unremarkable. We caught another glomerulus, and this is only seen on the h &E stain, which we don't normally show to you because it's very, very pink. But this was the only level where we could see this change in the glomerulus. And what we're seeing here again is the glomerulus over here. If you follow it to this end, this is the, uh, the outflow of Bowman's capsule into the proximal tubule of this nephron. So this is the glomerular tubular junction over here. And so uh, by definition, the opposite end is the hilum, the, uh, the hilar end of the, the uh, or the vascular pole of the glomerulus. And again, here, we don't see the normal structures. Instead, we see kind of a mass of pink material, that fibrin-like material again. And so here again, we're uh, invoking that there is a necrotizing um, uh, vasculitis that is involving the uh, hilar arterioles of this glomerulus. So again, we don't have a glomerulonephritis, but it's the proximal vessels that are being involved, both you know, medium-sized vessels and arcuate-sized vessels, and perhaps even uh, um, the arterioles that are feeding into to the, uh, the, the glomeruli. So there's a question from Abal about vasovasorum involvement. Yeah, uh, um, that's a good idea. It's generally larger vessels, uh, more like the aorta and branch vessels off the aorta, they're gonna have vasovasorum. The arcuate arteries shouldn't necessarily have a vasovasorum within the kidney parenchyma itself. So that really looked like it was recanalization uh, of an old um, occlusion uh, injury to that vessel. So um, as we were looking around, um, we didn't, like I said, we didn't have a great sampling of glomeruli. We didn't see glomerulonephritis or crescents or necrosis in the glomeruli, but we did see some evidence of bleeding. There was some blood in some of the tubules, so it's not widespread. And so we can't confidently, confidently exclude that there was a glomerulonephritis hiding somewhere uh, in this biopsy. We just perhaps didn't catch it, but we definitely got a more proximal vasculitis involving the arterioles of the glomeruli and also um, perhaps an arcuate sized uh, vessel. Now the immunofluorescence and EM were almost non-contributory. There were new, no immune complexes by IF. Um, there was only one uh, hilar arteriole uh, that was stained by fibrin and I can show you that in the next slide. EM, unfortunately, there was again, no glomeruli renal tissue available for examination. So uh, we couldn't perform those uh, particular studies. So here is that EM um, uh, image that I was telling you about. So here again, for your reference is the glomerulus. Again, we're not seeing fibrin staining of the glomerulus itself, but we're seeing staining at the proximity of the, of the, uh, the glomerulus, which we are thinking that this is the hilum, the hilar arterioles that are involved by the necrotizing vasculitis. So this would correlate with that H&E um, stain section that I showed you a couple of slides ago. So our final diagnosis, of, there was, this was a necrotizing vasculitis that was MPO ANCA associated with involvement of medium-sized artery, at least in, in terms of the kidney biopsy reference size, and also some glomerular uh, uh, arterioles. There seemed to be only mild uh, tubular atrophy and interstitial fibrosis in the sample that we got. Um, and so we noted that, of course, there were no glomerular immune complexes. At least we had one glomerulus to roll that out. Um, so this would certainly fit with that high ANCA titer, um, though we were not confident in completely excluding a crescentic glomerulonephritis somewhere else in the biopsy since we were seeing blood in the tubules. We just didn't have a great sample for that. 
And really, I think this case is a, a good case to learn from because uh, everything smelled like it was going to be an ankyovasculitis. We had necrotizing vasculitis. It just involved the proximal vessels before, uh, you know, upstream of the glomeruli. And so this would basically shut off flow to the glomeruli, cause an acute drop in kidney function, but perhaps would uh, still account for that very bland urinary sediment uh, that uh, Alex and the team uh, were seeing. Now, interestingly, uh, you know, there was another thought that rheumatology was also involved. Uh, there was some thought that this could be a scleroderma renal crisis. I think the anti-SCL70 antibody was, uh, was positive. We clearly have necrotizing vasculitis in this case. Um, we didn't see some of the other changes that we think about uh, of scleroderma renal crisis, like the TMA-like changes, onion skinning of vessels. Um, and so this is really thought to be more of an ANCA-associated uh, disease process. And so this has been uh, reported in this uh, opinion piece uh, from about 10 years ago. Um, um, and so, you know, in Wendy, we think about the ANCA associated uh, disease processes. I mean, they can have a variety of presentations. We think about the crescentic and necrotizing GNs, the most common. But of course, you can have extra glomerular involvement, perhaps in combination with uh, the crescentic glomerular nephritis. You can also have involvement of the medulla, so you can have a medullary angiitis. And in many of these cases, we're going to see blood in the urine. Um, and so that's going to tip you off that there's an active GN um, that's occurring. However, in rare cases, you can have a very normal or bland urine sediment, as was the case here. Um, and so then there's the apparent disconnect between the serologic studies with ANCA and MPO and PR3. Uh, and the bland urine sediment. And as Abal, uh, you know, astutely uh, noted, if there's, uh, this is really affecting, um, you know, the glomeruli prox, or, you know, if the lesion is proximal to the glomeruli, then uh, it, they're not going to contribute very much to the blood and the urine at all. And that's really what we think was going on um, in this case. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. And Alex, I don't know if you wanted to give a, a quick follow-up. Yeah, um, sure. She she was treated with um, uh, rituximab, um, uh, plasma exchange, uh, and then she is unfortunately still dialysis dependent. Um, urine output has picked up a little bit, but she has not been able to be liberated from dialysis. But the pulmonary manifestations seem to have uh, improved. Chest X-rays sort of cleared up, so some signs of of improvement. Okay, good. Um... So let me get the other case up here. Um, one second. So this is uh, uh, a case that uh, I saw together with uh, Leah. Okay. Screen sharing has failed to start. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. All right, so this is our second case, or last case actually for the, case, uh, for the day. Um, and Dr. Hazley will take it away with the clinical presentation. Uh, great. So this is a 38-year-old man with a polysubstance use disorder, um, paranoid schizophrenia, and cirrhosis secondary to hepatitis C, presenting with AKI and proteinuria. Um, earlier this year, he was admitted to Harborview. He presented with a hemoglobin of 3.3, a creatinine of 3.5, and a protein-creatinine ratio of about 16 grams. And during that admission, he was found to have a very large spleen, diffuse lymphadenopathy, skin abscesses, polymicrobial bacteremia. Um, he actually underwent quite a big workup. He had a bone marrow and lymph node biopsies given the size of his lymph nodes, and these, those were actually unrevealing. Um, his creatinine then increased to five, but he left AMA um, before nephrology could complete their workup. And then he came back about three days later with the creatinine of 5.9. Um, just to go through this quickly, his past medical history, as shown, schizophrenia, polysubstance use disorder, untreated hep C, he did have a history of nocardia skin abscesses. Uh, those are his medications. Um, on exam, he did not make eye contact. He would only say yes or no. He had no icterus. Um, he looked quite chronic, chronically ill. His spleen was enormous. 
Um, he had three plus pitting edema of the arms and legs and multiple crusting excoriations over his legs. Um, this is a selection of both uh, renally important on the left and more ID, et cetera, on the right. You can just look through the right and see all the many things that were sent um, working up his splenomegaly um, and um, lymphadenopathy. On the left, his creatinine was at six at that point when we were called. His albumin was 2.3. He was anemic and thrombocytopenic. His urine sediment showed many red cells, a few of which were dysmorphic. Uh, we thought there was a red cell cast. Um, and there was one oval fat body. Um, labs were notable in red here for um, a low C3 and C4, and his HCV quantitative was close to 3 million. Um, SPEP in particular showed oligoclonal banding, um, but no clonality, and um, PLA2R was negative. A biopsy was performed. Okay, so uh, thank you. Um... Leah, so very complex patient, lots of uh, lots of things going on. We've got uh, infection, hepatitis C. Um, uh, we've got you know both proteinuria and uh, acute kidney failure as well. So thoughts, uh, what might be going on? What might we might see on the biopsy? Polysubstance abuse too. Let's see what the AA amyloid, right. So everyone read uh, Matt's mind. I was probably thinking of it as well. So this is a fairly typical uh, case history for our patients that we see with the AA amyloid, at least in this region. Um, another comment from Abal was C4 is very low. So perhaps classical pathway activation, uh, hepatitis C, MPGN, potentially with cryoglobulins, uh, plus or minus. Uh, I think the cryo studies were negative, right, Leah? Yes, negative. Okay. But uh, good thought. I mean, sometimes there are rheumatoid factors. Rheumatoid factor is negative. Cryos weren't back at the time of the biopsy. But so. Okay. So perhaps a little less likely, but you know, cryos can act in strange fair ways as well. Okay. So let's take a look at the uh, the biopsy. Okay. So at um, low power, we can see that there is uh, a lot of chronic injury. Uh, we have a couple of glomeruli that uh, are shown at this um, in this particular field. And so there, uh, there's an accumulation of this very pale eosinophilic material um, that's expanding the mesangial areas, kind of uh, infiltrating into the glomerular capillary walls. Similar material can be seen kind of encasing the tubular based membranes, and kind of uh, infiltrating into the interstitium. Um, so at higher power, we can see this again. We've got this pink material all over the place. And so as um, as Matt said, okay, uh, AA amyloid. So this certainly looks like uh, amyloidosis. Um, this is fairly common. Why am I showing you this uh, after the very last biopsy conference of the year? Um, well, even though this patient had the you know very typical history for an AA amyloid in, in our region, um, doesn't mean that they can't get other things. And so when we start looking at this biopsy a little closer, sure, there is amyloid, but let's take a look at the glomeruli. Within the glomeruli, the few capillary loops that are patent show inflammatory cells that are coming in. And just like in Bizat's case, the, the cells that are infiltrating are neutrophils. So here's another uh, a view of this again, showing the amyloid deposits of the PAS. And again, you can see these polylobate, almost like little black ants uh, percolating through the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the glomerular capillary loops. So, so this kind of infiltrated pattern, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, is typical for amyloidosis, but then Abal has another differential here. Could this be infiltration by a fibrillary glomerulonephritis and hepatitis C would certainly be a risk factor for that. So great thought there. So we would need immunofluorescence to try to uh, um, um, uh, identify that uh, a little bit further. However, we got the Congo, and the Congo here is uh, brightly positive, uh, and it's labeling the presumably amyloid deposits in the glomeruli, the tubular basement membranes, it's outlining some vessels, it was everywhere. So this is still making a good strong case for uh, amyloidosis at this point, though there can be congophilic fibrillary um, uh, cases that those have been reported by ourselves and others. 
uh, they tend not to be as widespread as uh, we are seeing uh, here. This is much more the typical picture for AA um, type amyloid. But is it AA amyloid for this case? This is certainly amyloid, but how can we type it further? So um, first of all, I'll just show you that this is nicely biofringent in that same field. Uh, you can see that uh, it uh, um, uh, polarizes nicely with the typical apple green uh, biofringence. So to evaluate whether this was AA amyloid, which was the leading diagnosis versus something else, we did uh, amyloid A immunostain. And so we can see again that all those amyloid deposits that we're labeling with Congo now also labeled uh, with the brown stain for uh, amyloid A uh, protein. So all, all evidence is pointing that the, this pink material that's infiltrating everything is um, AA amyloid. And so we look a little further. And again, remember that we had a few glomeruli uh, that were showing infiltrating um, and neutrophils. We even saw a, a glomerulus or two with cellular reactions in the urinary space that were very suspicious for crescents with uh, either you know, tubularization here, or maybe even a break in the, uh, the glomerular capillary base membranes. And so crescents can certainly have been reported with amyloidosis and definitely with an AA amyloidosis. But we also had a glomerular nephritis that was uh, kind of hiding together with the amyloid um, deposits. So could some of this crescent formation be related um, to that? So that was, again, uh, this was not just the usual AA amyloid case. There seemed to be something additional that was, uh, that was going on as well. So again, let's take a look, higher power look at these glomeruli. And again, you can appreciate these uh, polylobated, polynucle uh, uh, the polylobated nuclei of the neutrophils, these inflammatory cells that are really kind of stuffing these capillaries, the few that are uninvolved and not blocked off by the amyloid uh, deposits. So, so let's so we've at least established the diagnosis of AA amyloid. Um, we then proceeded to the immunofluorescence studies to try to understand if there was another superimposed GN uh, on top of the AA amyloid here. So the immunofluorescence was significant for uh, some IgG, which was uh, kind of on the dimmer side, one plus. It was present both in the mesangial regions and also along the glomerular capillary walls. But really the, the most striking um, um, uh, also, there was a component of IgA, which was also in a similar type of intensity to, um, to IgG, about one plus. So we have a little bit of IgG and IgA, but the most striking immunoreactant was C3. And this was about three to four plus in intensity, clearly mesangial and also in the capillary walls uh, as well, as you can see over here. So we clearly have an immune complex process. Uh, it has, uh, has got both IgG and IgA. It's associated with neutrophil influx and dominance of C3 within the immune deposits um, as well. So we wondered now, could this be related to the neutrophils that we're seeing uh, coming into the glomerular capillaries? And so we proceeded with electron microscopy. Now remember, we have already amyloid deposits and the immunofluorescence is telling us that we might also have immune deposits. So this was gonna be a challenging case to try to decipher what was going on by EM. But I'll show you this to uh, really make the case that you can really tease out these two um, different processes if you look carefully, and uh, I'll highlight the, 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 the findings for both of them. There was a question from Abal whether he had active infection at the time of biopsy. Um, he had finished antibiotics for his bacteremia, but it was a recent, recent polymicrobial bacteremia with three different bacteria, so yeah. Yeah, okay. And so, so here we can see a couple of uh, views of kind of the mesangium and uh, the, the subendothelial space uh, um, over here. And you can see this very complex infiltration pattern uh, in there. You can see some darker gray areas that might correspond to the immune deposits that we're seeing. And then we see, also see some more fibrillary material here at the higher power that could correspond to the amyloid uh, deposits. So again, when we look at these, you know, the areas that clearly look like amyloid, you can see kind of this Jenga-like sticks, you know, randomly oriented fibrils, they're straight fibrils. And when we look at it at high magnification, they kind of have that a typical diameter of about 10 nanometers in, in, uh, in thickness. And so, you know, also considering that a diagnosis of fibrillary, um, the fibril diameter and also the very strong Congo positivity and AA positivity is leaning us more towards a diagnosis of AA amyloidosis. 
uh, across all three modalities. However, there, in addition to the amyloid that you can see these fibrils over here, there were some other areas, like I said before, here in the mesangium of more homogeneous looking immune deposits, which would correspond to the immunofluorescence studies uh, that we were seeing. And if you zoom in at a high power on this, it just looks very bland. It has no substructure, there's no fibrils. And so these would really correspond to the, the C3 dominant immune deposits that we were seeing by immunofluorescence uh, microscopy. We also saw similar kind of patterns of infiltration in, in the subendothelial space of the capillary walls. So you can see fibrillary material over here admixed with more immune deposits as, as well. So really kind of a, you know, a concurrent uh, injury process with both uh, amyloid fibrils and conventional immune deposits. There were some also some subepithelial uh, deposits which were kind of vaguely hump like very small humps um, in the subepithelial space too. So we had mesangial de immune deposits, subendothelial immune deposits, rare subepithelial deposits, and of course amyloid fibrils infiltrating all of those areas as well. And again, we can see, you know, an infiltrating inflammatory cell, probably a neutrophil coming in as uh, our monocyte over here as well. So again, some of these uh, capillary walls are really markedly uh, infiltrated by these immune deposits. Uh, so we almost started thinking, could this be almost like a dense deposit disease like presentation? They were kind of sausage uh, uh, looking in some areas, but in other areas, they had a more conventional appearance of immune deposits uh, as well. Here again, you can see kind of a coexistence of the amyloid fibrils and subepithelial deposits uh, as well. So we rendered a final diagnosis of kind of a secondary amyloidosis AA type. It was extensively involving you know, all parts of the kidney. We also uh, uh, noted that there was a recent or ongoing infection um, and then there's the C3 dominance uh, of the, uh, in the immune deposits. Uh, there was a coexistence of kind of IgA and IgG, though much lower than the C3. And so we favored with the exudative presentation uh, that this could be an infection related uh, GN, but also given the extent of the C3 in the immune deposits, given the very low C3 levels uh, seen serologically, and some of the kind of sausage appearance of some of those immune deposits, there was also a question of could this be uh, C3GN, that it is either being unmasked or uh, concurrent uh, with uh, the infection related uh, GN um, as, as well. Okay. So uh, I'll stop there. Maybe uh, Leah can, here's a quick follow up here. Um, sure. So his creatinine continued to go up after biopsy to seven. Uh, kind of stabilized there and they discharged him. Uh, two weeks later, he came back in for a drug overdose, during which time the creatinine started to trend down. And then recently we saw him, he was he did not make it into clinic until recently where his edema was much improved. Um, he was still using and had purulent wounds on his arms. His creatinine was down to 3.38. Protein creatinine ratio was still in nephrotic range. Uh, his C3 had increased to 46 and his C4 had normalized, so. Yeah, so kind of a tough case. So the, the, the jury is still out about the C3 here as to whether, you know, there's still some, there may be some additional sources of infection here. Um, and so, uh, but at least uh, good to note that at least his edema has responded a little bit uh, so far, but very challenging. Yeah. Any final questions or comments? Uh, it makes me wonder a little bit, like, how many of the patients at Harborview who we diagnosed clinically with a amyloid in the setting of some abscesses and infections may have some some underlying infection-related GN as well that we just don't don't ever detect. Yeah. Yeah, no, great point. Rob, it seems like we're getting more and more cases of infection-related GN over the past couple of years. Or is that just um, sampling bias? Have you seen more come through? Or so? We've seen a, a decent amount recently. Um, I had a case from actually um, Dr. Amol Patel just uh, earlier this week of a diabetes plus infection related GN as well. So, but it's a bit anecdotal on our perspective. You know, so it would be it might be good to keep track of if that's your perception. Thank you so much. Okay, so we are right on time with the plus 10 tech delay. Um, thank you all and have a, have a great summer. Thanks, Ram. Thanks, Bazad and everyone. And um, 
we'll see everyone, of course, around, but have a good summer uh, with your Friday mornings back. And uh, you're in good hands with Dr. Butler for next year. It's been a pleasure moderating the last six years, and um, we'll see you around. Bye. Uh